and um, welcome to our meeting. Um, can, what what do you see? <laughs> I see you, Bob. That's all I see. You just see a slide. And the share screen. No, no, see it. There's, there's I see the screen. Screen. Okay, yeah. Good, good. Yeah. I can't see that. Okay. So. Um, so the title of our uh, conversation is a conversation about how to support family, students, education, and families regarding school counselors and race. And we're all like real experienced Zoomistas by now after six weeks of this. But um, <laughs> just a couple of Zoom things before we get started formally. Um, make sure your microphone's on mute. Um, use, there's emoji features at the bottom of the thing. You can do thumbs up, clap, whatever. Um, you can answer questions. You can leave comments in the chat feature. Um, you can use the raise your hand feature. Um, if you click on participants and find yourself, just to the right of your name is a little, it's a little thing where you can raise your hand. If you raise your hand, um, we can see that and we can call on you. Um, Cause like I said, there's 113 people on this right now. Um, and this is always good practice. But this is a particularly sensitive topic. I think we're we're dealing with this evening, so it's not really a it's not a therapy session. We're trying to find out what's going on. Um, let's avoid personal attacks and politics. Everybody's got some excellent counseling skills out there, especially online these days. Um, respect. One person speaks at a time and compassion. Just general stuff. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to President Carol Miller. <laughs> Hi guys, this is Carol. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I'm the president of NISCA this year. And we, I wanna say we're excited by this conversation. Um, we are, because we really are looking for some change. Um, at the same time, we're a little bit nervous of the conversation. So we have lots of feelings going into this and Part of our conversation is about all those feelings. So we wanna know how you're feeling. And if you have experiences that you'd like to share, we really wanna hear what those experiences are. Um, you, we wanna give you guys a voice. We want everyone to have a voice and we want you to feel like you have a place to be heard. Um, we have students that have voices too, and it's about how do we support them moving forward. So, the other thing to know about our little town hall tonight is that we're hoping that this isn't a, a one and done deal. This is going to be a continuing effort that we are making throughout the upcoming school year. And we are planning for several more of these conversation town halls to happen because they're important, you know, to be the change, you have to be the change. And so, we want to keep that. We don't want to lose sight. We don't want this to be a fad. We want this to be something that is really meaningful, that gives purpose to our work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm reading the chats as we go on. And um, we want it to be purposeful and meaningful. And we want it to continue. And we want these experiences to carry over into our day-to-day -day work with our kiddos. So with that, I am going to open up the conversation because it's not just me talking tonight. Um, it's about all of you guys. I want to say though, I am not an expert in this field. I'm just not an expert. I'd love to say that I am and maybe one day I will be, but right now I still myself have so much to learn and I look forward to these because with you, I'm going to be learning and I'm going to learn from some of you and I'm gonna help my kids. So I'm really looking forward to tonight and all the meetings that follow. So is there anyone that wants to share how you're feeling or any experiences that you wanna share so far? And don't be shy. <laughs> you could either unmute or raise your hand, we'll call it. I can't see everybody, so I don't know if anybody has their... It's hard to see with the screen share off. Up. You know, I'm going to turn the screen share off if someone... Okay. Okay. Oh, that's a little better. Yeah. 
One of the things I was thinking of, um, and um, we were writing, we wrote a statement regarding this last week. And one of the things that, that went in the statement that we saw a couple of other states, um, um, you know, refer to was the, was the challenge of, of working with our kids in a virtual way. And I was thinking that if I were working in school right now, you know, physically with my kids there and what was going on in the world was going on, I would pretty much know how to do that. You know, I, I would know what to do when they came to me. I would know who to refer them to. I might know, I might even know what to say or learn from them, but I don't, we don't have that opportunity right now because they're not there. How, how are other, how are other people dealing with that? Um, I'm not working in the school right now, but how are other people dealing with that challenge of uh, remote counseling, so to speak? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you please repeat that? <clears throat> well, I can say that I'm feeling um, challenged because like normally we would have our students face to face and that makes that's like our our big part of our job is face to face talking communicating um, I haven't had that much of an opportunity except for my small groups um, so I don't know how well, most of my students feel um, and sharing things I feel through like Google Docs or through Google Classroom just like documents or videos is just not enough I could engage really how my students are feeling towards the end of the school year. There's so many different emotions, things that are going on all at once. So I'm sure they're feeling overwhelmed. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, just, I, I, I can relate to that so specifically. I'm um, Marjorie Miller, uh, VP of Middle Level for NISCA. And uh, what I decided to do was to send out to my students, and my caseload is uh, 450, was just um, an emotion survey just so I could try to gather where they were, um, what their fears were, what their stress was, and, and things of that nature so that I, I, I knew what to address. So if you're interested, uh, you can just email me, you know, at VP Middle at niska.org and I, I will send you what that that survey was. It's it's not deep and and involved because I had to make it for remote learning, you, you know, just um, for for safety reasons, but just to kind of get a sense of where they were, what what their biggest fears, what their biggest concerns were. So if anyone is interested in that, please just, e just email me. Hi guys, I'm Katherine Schultz. I had introduced myself earlier. I'm from uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. Thank you for um, hosting. Um, our district has a crisis team. I'm a member of our crisis team. I see a couple of our, our counselors here from the district who are also on the crisis team. So it, our superintendent really felt like it was very important, um, as did we, to be able to open up um, safe rooms um, uh, for students to join over several days, um, as well as faculty to be able to kind of process their emotions and feelings. And I, I think we had a pretty good turnout. Christine, did you were you part of that on a day or two? Did you get some good turnout with students? Um, I was on the elementary school team. So um, we had about 12 families uh, jump in and out. Um, but it's elementary school. So, um, you know, it was kind of hard for them, I think, to speak about what they were worried about, like over Zoom. Um, but uh, the one child did bring up COVID um, 
and that that was their concern at the time. It's kind of cool. We've got people from all over the country on this. Yes. Milwaukee, of uh, the West Coast. I got a better mailing list than I thought I had. Well, I um, have someone who just messaged me in the chat who would like me to read a statement from her and ask a question for her, and she would like to remain anonymous. So here we go. Are you ready? The statement. My, sm my small rural district has mostly white students, but we do have some students of color. Our one black teacher's contract was terminated this year. We have one other teacher of color and it's troubling to me. And here is her question. Students and families wear and show Confederate flags in my district within the school building. I don't know how or if I should address this. Does anyone want to jump in? Um, can I, can I, I guess, address that or say something to that? Uh, my name is Clement Smith. I'm a school counselor in upstate New York in a small um, school district. It's a rural school district, predominantly white, um, very similar to the one you're probably referring to. Um, We've had that issue in the past with uh, people in the community and the students um, coming to school and through campus with uh, Confederate flags. And it almost took some convincing to the administrators that this is hateful, um, that it's offensive, um, that in your code of conduct, it already says that you know you're not allowed to uh, wear any image that uh, discriminates in any way. Um, so it, I think that you do have to push your administrators to understand um, what that means, and then also the type of culture that it's creating in your school. It's it's in a sense reinforcing mm -hmm. that that is okay. And also at the same time, um, uh, a marginalized population in your school. I wanted to jump in and say that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Is this Ruben? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is Ruben from uh, Chituaga Central. It's in, uh, first year suburb of Buffalo. Um, and I would definitely agree with uh, what Clement said. And one thing I've actually been talking to my superintendent about is, because in our high school, we have about like a 65, 70% minority student enrollment, but there's only three African-American staff members in the, in the high school. So I've been having a conversation with my superintendent saying um, that you have to have those in order to be become a better professional, you have to put some of your coworkers and colleagues in that uncomfortable position to have that conversation because um, that's the only way that you're going to get better. And it is, I mean, it's, um, I mean, it's sad to say, but it's reality right now. And in order to get better as a school district and as a group, you have to challenge each other with having those uncomfortable conversations. So if I, if I heard Clement and Ruben correctly, um, a good thing to do is to kind of downshift back into what policy says already. If it's already in the code of conduct, if it's already in district policy and, and so on, um, and, to, and to rely on that um, since it already exists. Did I hear that right? Yes. Okay. I, I think the Confederate flag and, and what, how we dress and the things that we, the articles that we display in our, our classrooms too, um, are also mentioned in educational law, right? There's definitely things that we can and cannot have in our rooms, right? There needs to be a separation of, of religion. There needs to be a separation of things that will marginalize students. So I think we have to be, we have to really call people out on those things to say, listen, we're not in the, the job here to make people feel bad or feel like they don't belong or come into a room and say, oh, like, 
I'm being offended and you know, I, I don't feel safe here. Our job is to make kids feel safe. Um, I have a, a statement, that's okay. Is this <laughs> Ivy? Yes. Um, Hi, Ivy. Hi, I'm not a school counselor yet. I'm actually a student, um, but I do have, um, I don't, you know, I know that there's strength in numbers and if there's some way that, I'm sure if you're feeling uh, a way about this, there may be, you know, some other faculty that, you know, shares that feeling and I'm not sure exactly how you could get about, you know, maybe coming together because um, to try to like to to express this because it's harder to to go to administration and let them know how you're feeling by yourself. Um, so if there's some way that you can form like a community where where you guys can uh, get together and and try to uh, work towards approaching the administration that way. Um, I, I don't know if it'll be best to do it by yourself. Ivy, I think that's really great advice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. This is Gail Reed Barnett, past president of NISCA. Um, I think education is the best key. We need to educate one another about the Confederate flag. We need to educate one another about the, the indigenous people, the Indians that are here. Um, it's, it's about educating, educating, educating. And yes, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but guess what? It's uncomfortable, but once you educate someone about the history of where one has come from, I think people began to feel better um, about themselves and other people began to understand the culture. So by you having the Confederate flag, it's a teachable moment. You know, teach the students, teach them what the Confederate flag means um, and see where that goes. Are the students asking about the Confederate flag or is it just there and no one is mentioning it? Um, Gail, she doesn't say. Okay, well, Clement, who says it, and you said it's upstate New York, the Confederate flag? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. deep. <laughs> okay, so is anyone talking about it? Are students asking questions about it? Or well, um, you know, for us, it's been a part of the culture for a long time. So students, I think the majority of students know exactly what it means or what it represents. Um, I have found, however, that um, I had one student in particular that I can remember that he, um, one of the assistant principals came in my office and he was telling me about this student who was my student and how, um, you know, he got in trouble for carrying a Confederate flag and how he thinks that he might have some, um, I guess, racist tendencies, maybe. Um, and when he told me who the student was, I was shocked because this was a student that came to eat breakfast with me every day. <laughs> um, and after talking to the student, I realized that he just didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Like, so I do think that you are uh, correct. You're being very accurate um, with having to educate, you know, the faculty, the staff, and students on what exactly that means. I think for him, it was just something he was born into, you know. His father was into that, his grandfather was into that, and he really didn't know the uh, in-depth effects um, of what that flag means. So it wasn't in response to the last couple of weeks, it's part of the background in that area. Did I, did I say that right? So the, the flying of the Confederate flag isn't in response to what's been going on for the last two, three weeks. It's just part of the background in some communities. Um, yeah, I mean, all, all kinds of things are coming up regarding what has happened in the last couple of weeks and, and people are out there protesting, you know, black and white, blue, green out there protesting. But when I say educate, remember, hate is taught. It's a learned behavior. 
And we just have to take those hateful things and turn to something positive. Because like the, the, like the young man was saying about the family of, of, of um, this youngster who, you know, he was just caring, but he didn't know why, because he was brought up in that situation. So we as school counselors, um, I would say I like the leaders because we're there for the students' emotional and social being. And we just need to educate them about, you know, yeah, that was part of history, but this is the reason why it's there. And this is the reason why it shouldn't be there. Like certain statues, this is the reason why it was there. And this is the reason why it shouldn't be there. You don't want to be reminded of negative, of, of you don't want to be reminded of, of, of negative things because it doesn't get better, it progresses. So I'm big on education. Um, as a school counselor, as a retired school counselor, even as, a, a, um, as I talk to young people today, we talk about the Confederate flag. We talk about slavery. We talk about, um, I don't know if you guys heard about Tulsa, Oklahoma. I knew about Tuska, Oklahoma, but to the extent and actually looking at what happened, I'm like, wow. You know, so these are the things that we have to talk to um, talk to our students about, so that they will understand it's not our fault, it's not their fault. That's how it was at that time. So now that time is over. We need to continue to move on, and we need to, you know, we need to ask those questions like, why is there so much be uh, brutality? Why, you know, how can we make the system better? You know, what can we do as a, a a culture of school counselors to make it better for our students. Because guess what? They're going to have to go out there and they're going to have to change the world, live in the world, get jobs. Um, but we have to make them feel good about themselves so that they, they know that they're not inferior. They know that they can be anybody, any, they can be what they want to be without people trying to block them. Um, we all belong to the human race, and that's how we need to counsel our students as belonging to the human race. And they know the history behind it. Right. Once you know where you, know you come from, to. you know where you're going. That's right. Right. And if I was just to add anything, um, my name is Angelica. I'm uh, also a school counselor in upstate New York. Um, but I just I also wanted to add that Black history is American history, so it's just not it shouldn't just be February, one. And then two, it should be in a curriculum across the board um, because a lot of my white uh, peers, and as well as for myself, I think our, our education isn't reflective of our horrendous history. And I think some of the issues or all of the, some of the role of why uncomfortable conversation happens is because we don't talk about race enough. Um, and we don't talk about the disparities across education as well as health, um, just the uh, police reform. There's so many different platforms um, that are, are that are in need of addressing. Um, but it's, it has to start, I think, also in the classroom, in the curriculum, and everybody has to understand um, that we all have a part to play in making everyone feel comfortable and everyone feeling safe. Um, and I think as school counselors, we always play such an a interesting role. And I just am excited. And I'm tired. I'm tired, exhausted <laughs> from all of the <laughs> hashtags and all of, since George Floyd, God bless his soul and his family. My heart goes out to his family. And, and then someone else just lost one of their students. I think sister had a uh, death in their family. And my heart goes out to that family. And they'll be in my prayers as well. Um, there's, it, there's been Atlanta, Georgia. There's been so many deaths. People, it's just, it's very, it's just, it's a heaviness on me of all the deaths and all the just the pain um, that people are experiencing. Um, so where am I going with this? Besides being tired and exhausted from seeing all of this, it's just trauma. It's traumatizing and it's traumatic seeing all of the images of these um, black and brown bodies um, losing their lives um, is it's, it's very overwhelming. So I'll just add that and leave it there. And I appreciate you all. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> yeah, thank you. thank you. I think 
and I'm going to talk personally a little bit. Um, you know, having conversations sometimes as a school counselor, I think you always want to make sure that you are saying things that are politically correct or that aren't offensive to other people. And I think sometimes what makes the conversations difficult, especially for white people, is that we don't want to offend people. At least for me personally. And then as yeah. I am I'm growing- Can you be, be a little more specific? Yeah, so, like sometimes it's like, you know, for a while there I was like, can I even say black person? Like with, and I don't want it to be offensive. And, you know, but the more conversations I'm having with people, the more I'm learning about what things you can say, what things, you know, people would prefer to hear, right? So um, it's making the uncomfortable a little bit more comfortable. But the thing that I've also realized for myself is that what I need to do is sometimes make a statement like, if I say something that's offensive to you, I'm really sorry. I'm trying to learn and as I'm learning, can you please help to correct anything that I might say that's, that is offensive because I want to do better. And I think that we need to sometimes do that in these types of conversations because we are trying to really learn. And the only way we learn is by making mistakes sometimes. And I think you made a valid point. I would tell you I'm a school counselor in um, Fresh Meadows, Queens, uh, Francis Sluice High School. And I would tell you, often in my office, I have students who inquire various questions about different things. And I had a couple of students come to me who were of Asian descent, and they said to me, you know, Ms. Barnes, I use the N-word. I call my friends N-word. And they said, you know, um, is that okay? And I said, no, it's not okay. But just like what you said, we had a conversation. And then after we had that conversation, they understood why it wasn't okay, why it was offensive, and why many people would feel uncomfortable about it. And just like what you said, you said the key thing is about having conversations. You may not feel comfortable always to express yourself. You may not feel comfortable in, in, in reference to knowing what words exactly to say that won't be But you have to start somewhere. So I would just say, I would think that as educators, we have to get our young people comfortable enough to want to talk, to want to really um, explore options of how we communicate and appreciate each other. I would tell you one of the things that I do during Black History Month, because just like um, one of the other counselors said, Black History Month is not just one month. It is our life. It's a part of American history. So during that month, typically, I always celebrate everyone's culture. So with my counseling groups, and I'm in a school that celebrates diversity, I'm in a school that is um, blessed to be so diverse, but yet there are large groups of people than others. So what I do if those uh, other groups are not in that group, I still include some information about that. Like I had one student, um, he didn't know anything about Chinese New Year, and he happened to be Chinese descent. So I said to him, I want you to go home. When you come back next Tuesday for group, bring something about, you know, uh, Chinese New Year. And he said, okay. And he did. So he taught us. I had another student bring in food. But the point that I'm trying to make is that I think for the questions that we don't know, we can learn a lot from our students. And we can also challenge them to go out and find something else about someone else's culture. And that will give us information because we may not always have the answer. We're not always going to have the answer. So the amount of things that I learn, a lot of times I just tell the students, you go find it. You find that information. I'll find this, you find that, and we'll come and we'll discuss it together. Because at least that way, everybody's learning. So I would just say as counselors, we could do that. I see uh, Roberto's got his hand up. Yeah, hi. How are you? Uh, let me just turn my uh, video on. Hi. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm also a school counselor at Francis Lewis High School, and I know um, I really appreciate this I guess, safe space for us to, as educators, to talk about different ways to address uh, the issues, I guess, that we're under. But I'm wondering if, if, if anyone here has had some kind of, uh, I guess, uh, school-wide or school-wide, uh, school-level, like, you know, um, effort to kind of address these issues, uh, you know, the past couple of weeks. I, I, I want to know what it looks like. I'd like to know what is exactly what it looks like. Is it 
through uh, certain subject classes? Is it uh, school-wide? Is it done through advisories? Is it done? Because I think, if, if anything, I think it's great to make uh, an effort to address these issues, but it has to be like a, a, a organized, you know, uh, effort. So I'm curious to know if anyone here has done that in their school and what it looks like. Uh, we're in a school of over 4,000 students and, you know, sometimes, you know, it's a challenge to do that. So I'm curious to know, you know, how does that happen in your school? Uh, who spearheaded these efforts? You know, um, anyone could share, please, I would appreciate it. So. Um, oh, go ahead, James, please. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I mean, I, I can't speak to the public schools. I just know that when it first happened, when it was the first week, I, I spoke with our freshman and sophomore counselor because I, I do junior guidance classes and they're geared towards college. And I spoke with her and I said, we have to mention what's going on. We have to talk about it, um, even if it's uncomfortable. And she agreed. So I thought it was important that when I had these junior classes, the first five minutes, at least the first five minutes, I said George Floyd's name. Now you have to understand this was before we, I mean, this was the beginning of the protest, but I thought it was important to condemn what happened but to also say his name. She did the same thing as well. And it wasn't, it wasn't until really the next week that my school and then other Catholic schools had to put out a statement. You have to. And they really, I, I think at first they wanted to gear it towards God and that's wonderful and that's great. But they had to put out an anti-racism statement. Um, and and I'm, it's, not, it's not about me. I'm not saying that I did anything or any other counselor did anything but you have to say his name. You have to put out an anti-racism statement. We had to speak to these students. Now in my Zoom classes, there was silence because I had 20 students in each class. But for the classes that I had under five students, they started to talk. And they, they, when there were smaller classes, they started to talk to me about, yeah, oh my God, what's going on? And you know, I might go to the protest. I said, talk to your parents before you go. But I think it was important to say his name. So, you know, that's what we did. And then there was a statement on the website. And I think that was important. It's not enough, but I think it's a start. So I can only speak to the private schools, the Catholic schools, but I think that's how you begin. Because this platform, the Zoom platform, the Google Meets, this platform is, is not the best for dealing with students who really need support. But that that's how I would begin. Yeah, and then the, um, so this is James White from up, upstate New York. Um, so in our school, we have uh, an engagement dean. Um, we're 10,000 kids, urban urban setting in, in um, Schenectady. And so we had uh, an engagement dean and they do uh, circle ups with students. And so they've been offering like a circle up session essentially like every day. Um, just talking about, again, safe space, talk about feelings, thoughts, emotions. Um, and it's just a really welcoming area for, you know, for students. And so they offer them at different times of the day. So it's like, hey, like if you have a Zoom meet in the morning or midday or afternoon, um, you know, you're able to get on at least one of them. And so I think that's an opportunity, again, for safe space for students to be able to exchange thoughts, feelings, and emotions and how they're feeling. The other thing they do is also for staff is offering, um, you know, one for staff, uh, you know, once a week within your building to be able to, again, talk about that safe space, how you're feeling. Uh, it's not that easy. That's really um, so it helps. that's another thing that, um, you know, our school is doing as well as they also did put out a statement um, as well. And then also our, our, our um, school also has like a, a different affinity groups that like meet like once a month sometimes. And so like, you know, um, you know for, for African-Americans or different ethnicity groups, um, they also do that as well. Um, so those are just one, one of the ways that our district is doing it. The other thing is like, um, talking about like how, how are we going to lead this effort going forward and it's like as counselors we're all we're used to having that uncomfortable conversation you know whether it's a male counselor and you're dealing with you know a, um, you know a, a female teenage student that's dealing with different issues or a male student whatever and so we're all like our job is uncomfortable we're put in uncomfortable situations all the time to talk to that teacher that's giving, giving a student a hard time or that student that doesn't want to talk to that teacher because they're giving them a hard time or a parent or an administrator or whatever so if not you then who and so we need to be part of that leading effort to be able to create that change if we want to see it. And so, again, we're already used to having these conversations that are uncomfortable. So if we know our staff members are going to be uncomfortable, 
like we just can't pass the buck like it gets happened all the time in schools. Well, I thought it was your responsibility, your responsibility, your responsibility. It's like, no, you got to step up and we got to be that leader that's going to make that change. Uh, Roberto, I want to um, also, uh, my name is Jessica. I'm uh, from an um, independent school in Staten Island, New York. Um, I wanted to let you know what our school has done. I've been very surprised with them. It's my first year with this school. Um, but we started off with a statement letter going out to the entire community. And then immediately after the statement letter, there was an opportunity for a safe space for staff. And it was a we, and then a week later, we had another safe space for staff. And the D diversity committee, which used to be only five staff members, uh, turned to 40 staff members. Wow. And from that meeting, um, we broke off into subcommittees deciding how are we going to do this all together? Because that's what we have to do here. So there are six subcommittees from, this, from the diversity group. And there's, there was one, one subcommittee is, t is um, facilitating a faculty read this summer. Um, another subcommittee is working on curriculum to make sure that every single class addresses these social justice issues and history um, or to unlearn and relearn what we need to. Um, there is another subcommittee for student support. Um, myself and the other counselor, we've been sending out weekly uh, just temperature check-ins. How are you? You know, um, if you want to talk, you can. It's anonymous and people just kind of write what they're feeling and thinking, what they're confused about, what they have questions about, and it helps us. We're, we're unfortunately out of school. Our school has ended, so this has been really, really complicated to get in touch with the students, um, but we've extent we've opened up groups anyway um the student the, the students who are in the student government have created their own student-led movie clubs and they're they're going to watch a movie every friday night this summer um and we've been meeting the diversity committee has been leading the, these changes and just coming up with plans we've been meeting weekly so um, I didn't know how this was going to happen. I think they tried to do this uh, four years ago and there was extreme backlash from the community and parents because no one was trained with how to conduct these conversations. They didn't have the language. They didn't have the, the backing. Um, a lot of our families are police officers or work in um, civil jobs as such. And um, it is, it's tricky to navigate the language to ensure that we are supportive of people and social justice and re-education. Um, so the school is not taking any political stances. The school is, is it's, they're not making it political at all. It's about relearning our history and re-educating. So that's been a really um, amazing um, opportunity and discussion and it's it, it just kind of like fell in with a bunch of people with with motivation and I hope Roberto that can help organize some ideas for you. Someone named Rosa had her hand up. Is she still? That was, that was great, Jessica. Yeah. Jessica, I really love the idea of the, the student movies on Friday, too. I think that's, that's great to pull everybody together. Okay. I, I, I love the idea that it's student-led. Um, that just is everything. We wanted to stay out of that we because we're going to be we're going to be leading or we're going to be facilitating many things come September. Um, but they we wanted to support their their journey in this. Um, and we're are we're we were nervous because in the past conversations did not end well. Um, and it really, you know, created quite a divide. We didn't handle it well. Um, 
but we feel like this is voluntary. So people who are choosing to be there want to be there and want to learn. And I feel like that, that creates a safer space than forcing a conversation for people who aren't ready. And that's also been another topic of conversation with our faculty is that accepting that we are all on different levels of this. We are all in different stages of relearning really? and to be accepting of where other people are at. Yeah, even if we're angry at where they're at and why they're there. Um, but to really, if, if we are gonna grow as a community, we need to be accepting of where everybody is. Wonderful, just, just wonderful. Any other um, ideas like that from various schools? I think, so I'm Claire Lalone, I'm a social worker in upstate New York. Um, I am loving all of these ideas and it's all stuff that I would love to take back to my school. It's so frustrating that we're now at the end of our school year and I'm curious as to how people are getting people on board. I think I have, I have a handful of teachers and professionals at my school that, you know, summer or not, they would be on board with this, but I'm, I'm just wondering how to engage folks in, you know, their time off, you know, as, as ridiculous as that sounds with the issues that we're facing, you know, there are people that once, you know, the, the end of the year hits, that's a wrap for them. Um, so how do we prepare for September without having everybody on board? You know, um, I, I did speak earlier, again, Catherine from um, out <coughs> Philadelphia uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, so this, this district-wide crisis team and county-wide crisis team that are, Reading School District is huge, um, very urban, and um, we've been anticipating with COVID just how our crisis team really can really capture and support students with um, family deaths and, you know, let's face it, large districts, faculty, you know, some faculty might not return. And so we're really planning and over the summer, our team is working together on ways to problem solve and do a manual for reopening. And then, and then everything happened in the last few weeks with the protests and it's just such a natural um, sort of um, netting a safety netting that we already have in place that now we can extend out to you know just as i said earlier community families students teachers st support staff that really are struggling with grief issues with just uncertainty with not feeling heard with feeling just a lack of um, social justice so I, I would encourage i mean if if for example your district doesn't have a crisis team maybe the neighboring districts do um, and or countywide. So sometimes it's not just school people, but it's mental health um, personnel that can come in and provide safe rooms for you. So I would encourage, you know, districts to reach out if you don't have that already and maybe start growing your own in-house crisis team because this, this doesn't just end because the school year ends. I mean, let's face it, COVID and what is happening nationwide, we've got like an election year. I mean, all of these things, it's huge. It's enormous. Um, I anticipate this, you know, going on through the spring. So we, we, as counselors, we, if we can't, if we don't have it grown in our own, you know, district, we need to go get it. We need to invite people in, get people trained, get people crisis trained. And really all it is, it's what we do anyway as mental health people. It's just being able to provide a safe room. And it's not just counselors on a crisis team. There's nurses, there's teachers. It's a, it's a larger group that doesn't just fall on the shoulders of, you know, you, who you would expect your social workers and counselors and, and school psychs. Um, so now's the time. I mean, grow it. We're, we, we're, we're creating a manual um, over the summer um, just about the reopening and what to expect and how to do all of this, you know, um, but we also have a superintendent that is very passionate about um, social justice and like he was the first one to come out and just say like we absolutely must have these forums like ne like yesterday, you know, like it was within 24 hours. So, um, so reach out to your neighboring people. Um, and if there's anything our district can provide. Um, I don't know, like at the end, if we, we should share out, you know, like moving forward. Yeah, just, to, just as a point of uh, interest, if, if you put something, the chat gets saved as a document. So if you put something in the chat, like a link, or there's some really good suggestions for reading and so on, and some questions, um, it's going to, that, that little chat gets saved. It'll, it'll be um, 
it'll be with the recording of this um, this meeting, so you can uh, you, know, you can look to it later. Um, okay. Any anybody else? Looking? I don't see any more hands right now. You know, I, I, know. I just want to say ASCA has some great uh, webinars on racism. Yeah. So if you guys are uh, members or not members, um, go to the ASCA website. They have some great great webinars. And you can take and use that in your practice as well as letting your principal know, you know, what's going on, your superintendent, what's going on. And you can use, you can use it, you know, to help you along. Because kids are going to be very, I mean, I don't know if we're going to open in September, you know, one minute they, we're going to have um, hybrid, we're going to have this, we're going to have, so no one really knows what's going to go on in September. Um, and I think when we, if we go back remotely or if we go back to the classroom, I think discussions we're still going to have discussions around um what's going on so i'm looking i'm looking for a question that somebody emailed me hang on the question was as school counselors we have unique opportunities to get to know one to get to know one-on-one -on -one any student different from us the, that part is easier than winning over the trust of the rest of the family what has worked in schools with no budget to hold events that bring families into the schools where relationships and trust can be established. I think one of the things that you do is you ask all your faculty members to, to bake and you have food because food always draws people in. And I know that, you know, you might be thinking I'm crazy, but food draws people, people in. Um, I know some of the things that we've done in our school in the past too, is we've also had um, a clothing swap and we invited like everybody to come to the clothing swap. And then we had a captive audience because people, they needed that or they wanted that or they wanted to get rid of stuff. So um, there's lots of, I think, unique avenues to take to try to get people into your buildings. To you just have to know what they want and what they need. Sorry to go off of that same thing. You use community resources and like sometimes like if you highlight like a, you know, if a certain restaurant or, or wants to, uh, you know, sponsor dinner or something, it also gives them free publicity as well. And then you've got now a captive audience where like now they might see a slight intake in some of the business that they're getting as well and to support locals. So I think, again, using those community resources, you know, YMCA, Boys and Girls Clubs, all different types of things that, you know, a lot of people in the community are already doing these things. So again, if you can partner with them, um, it just makes, you know, light work for everyone. At my last school, we had a family engagement night and we actually, James, we asked a lot of community programs to donate different things. And we had a ton of baskets that were like giveaways. Um, I mean, we did have a little school improvement money that we used to buy things like pine cones and bird feed and things like that. But um, most of the stuff, was actually donated to us and we had fantastic turnout. So, so I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm clock watching a little bit and I'm looking at our agenda. One of the last things on our agenda is, um, and Carol mentioned this at the beginning, is this is this meeting is not a one-off. We want to um, we want to develop some professional development as we move forward. Um, what particular topics, if you had to suggest, you know, we can brainstorm a little bit right now, if you had to suggest a topic that we could provide PD on, um, we could find a sage or an expert on that topic um, or a group of them and, and provide it. So what do you think we should do? What do you need? What might be easier too is if you have an idea to right now type it in the chat that so works. that we can keep that as well and we can go back through that and um, know what you guys want. It'll, I think it would be an easier way for us to to get those results. So think and type. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that came to mind them. immediately to me, I was out walking was uh, we had a speaker on on implicit bias at implicit bias at a um, conference a couple of years ago, and I think that that's a topic that is always of value. Um, can I just add something that's not about a training though? Sure. Yes. 
<laughs> Sorry. Because I was just talking to a colleague uh, again. And so, and I was, she was talking about her mother. And I said, well, is your mother 50? Like, and she's 57 years old. And she was like, my mom is older than that. And I was like, well, during your mother's lifetime, right? There was a point in time where Black people couldn't vote if she's at least 57 years old. So even though a lot of the things that we're talking about seems like it's a long time ago, it's really not that long ago. Um, and I just really was like thinking about that. And, and as, she, as we were talking about it, um, it was just a really good conversation. So I encourage um, folks to have conversations in safe spaces like we're doing now, but even in more so intimate spaces. Um, at my school, at um, my I, I attend a charter school. I'm a school counselor at a charter school, at an all girls charter school. And our girls led a, um, three of our seniors led a conversation in our sister talk, like a sister circle talk. And the, one of our seniors said that it's about what you do every day. So for the teachers, um, her, you know, her white teachers, it's about what are you doing every day that's going to really impact, like, the work that you do with your students. So the trainings are great, like implicit bias trainings are great, but um, what are you doing every day? And I thought that was so powerful coming from one of our students as she was sharing that um, with her, with within that um, sister talk circle. So I think that was just really um, important for me to share with you all as well. Hey, Bob, or this, hey, is, this is Tony um, from, from, from Buffalo. And and I definitely want to hit. I think uh, Angelica hit it hit it right on for uh, before she raised her hand. That's what was going through my mind. I think sometimes you ha need to tackle some of these issues um, locally. And and I was going to throw out there anybody who's in. I'm at the university at. Buff I'm a professor in the school counseling program at the university at Buffalo. I see some people from Western New York in the area. Um, you know. So those of you in the area, look me up. My emails. I, th I think in 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 the Buffalo area, we need to get together and and have some conversations to see how we can tackle some of these these issues here. So those of you in Buffalo, reach out to me. Um, I think we can have some some conversations um, in smaller groups, right? In in smaller groups where we can specifically see what we need and and see who our allies are. So I know in this space, there's not a lot of time to do that, but reach out and let's see what we can do out here. So Tony, maybe, maybe type your, um, type your email in the chat. Yeah. All right. That would be great. And it's, so don't look for Tony though. Look for Luis Antonio Tosado at the university at Buffalo. So, Cause if you look for Tony, you'll get lost. <laughs> Any final thoughts? I did want to add one more thing. Um, so just like a few years ago when bullying was the very large topic of discussion, the school had put out um, tons of resources and posters all over the school about bullying. So we've now decided when we do return to campus or the building to have microaggressions as the focus on all of the walls of posters about that and having all the teachers kind of make a pact to not ignore any comment. Excellent. So the slideshow will be posted as well. Um, there's a couple of clicks on the slideshow. Gail mentioned Ask has got a ton of great resources um, on this topic on their website, and the link is on that slide. Um, we also are going to have a web page for resources from this topic. Um, our statement is going to be there as well. Um, and the uh, kind of final commercial announcement is. Um, we're offering these webinars, these meetings for every school counselor in the state and apparently in the rest of the country. Um, <laughs> if, um, if you're not in this member, this is a great time to join. Um, and it enables us to um, um, 
keep doing these kinds of things to support the counselors in the state. And as always, if you have any questions, um, you can email um, Gail Reed Barnett at, no, you can, you can, you can email info at niska.org and it'll get to, the question will get to the right person. Um, any final thoughts? Um, I just want to say, I think this was a great first start, Niska. Thank you, Woo, the executive board. Um, Kathy Corbett is on, is on here as well. She's our public relations and region one. Bob is our executive director. Uh, Carol is our president, uh, president. And Cynthia Wally is also on here and she will be our incoming president. July 1st. <laughs> Oh July God. 1st. <laughs> she's, she's, she's also the chairperson of the uh, behavioral science um, at Mercy College, um, where I um, where I work. Um, I'll have a class in September. I'm really excited about that. So retirement is great. But what I wanted to say is that you have to know yourself. You have to love yourself in order to give the services to our students. So I would say to each and every one of you, you know, look, in, look deep inside of your soul so that when you go to counsel those innocent children, um, you will be able to say where they'll understand you, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. I if that makes you. sense. I see you. Yes. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's my um, little thing, you know, until we meet again. <laughs> this was great. I enjoyed it. I, you know, I, I, I felt some hesitation, but then some of you was able to put the hesitation away and just go for the gusto. So that was good, too. Kathy, are you there? I'm here. You, you're very quiet. I was late because my computer, I'm, I'm feeling sorry for myself. My computer was acting up and I can't even type.